We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you so much for such a blessed day. We thank you so much for our lives. We thank you so much for giving us the privilege to come into your presence once again. We pray that you bless us with your word. Speak to us directly. Build our lives on your word today, Lord Jesus. Open our hearts. Make us receptive to your word, Lord. Make our minds alert. We are here in your presence, Lord Jesus, and we know that we will not go back the same. We thank you, Lord Almighty. We give you glory. We adore you. We thank you so much. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of us are happy to be in the presence of the Lord? Okay. Tell someone beside you, it's a big privilege to be in the house of the Lord today. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may have your seats. And before we start, I want to say a very big thank you to man of God for giving me this privilege to step in his office to preach today. When he told me I was going to preach, I laughed because I didn't believe it. I thought it was a joke. Okay, let's begin. Um, today, I want us to treat a topic we've treated before, actually. So it's going to be like a revision, a revision on Christianity. Who can tell me the purpose for which God created man? Any ideas? Well, that's why we are here anyway. God created man for one major purpose, to fellowship with him, to live with him, in him, to live in him, to fellowship in him, to be with him. The Bible says that he created man in his own image and his own likeness. And in his own image means what? To look exactly like him. And in his own likeness means to function like him. Whatever God does, his words have power. So do our words, true or false. It's very much true. Our words also have power. So that is the purpose for which he created man. And the Bible tells us that when he created man, he stationed man in a special garden, the Garden of Eden. He kept man there. He gave him everything he needed. And he told him, he gave him some specific order not to eat from a particular tree in the garden. But some way, somehow, man was deceived. And so he fell. And we learned from previous services that he started dying. He died. And he's still dying. And that wasn't the end of it. The fact that God created him to be like him and him falling didn't mean that God had forgotten man. No, he didn't forget man. He went after man. He pursued man because man was, he created man in a very special way that he couldn't just let man be where he was. And so that began the journey of Christianity. He had to put certain strategies into place to bring man back onto himself. And one of the ways that God puts into place is through the word. He, he had to put his purpose, his plans, his vision for man in a book that we Christians call the Bible. The Bible contains the written word of God and we learned in previous services that in Greek it means what? Logos. The Logos is the written word of God. And so he put the purpose and the plans, the visions that he had for God, for man in it. Because when man fell, he, got, he, he adapted a new nature that perfect nature that God created him to be like him was no more. And we know that God is a God who cannot deal with sin, right? He can deal with evil. So when man fell, it brought about two natures, the nature of God and then the nature of man. 
And because he fell, that nature was, the, the bridge, the fellowship that he had with man was broken. There was no way he could fellowship well with man. He couldn't fellowship with man the way he wanted to fellowship with him. So, the word of God is logos in Greek. And the word of God in itself, the Bible in itself, hasn't got as much power as we think. When I was young, I remember sometimes when I fell sick, I would get very close to the Bible. Sometimes you fall sick and you feel as if you are dying. Sometimes you even feel as if you are already dead. But you just get closer to the Bible. When you are sleeping, you put the Bible on your chest. You read the Bible now and then because you think it's so powerful. But I realize that it is not true. The Bible in itself hasn't got as much power as we think. But the part of the Bible or the Word of God that has the power is what we call rhema. When you study the Word, you meditate on it, you murmur, you make it a part of your life, you live it, and it gets mingled with your spirit. It activates, and that is where the power is generated. But you just quote in the Bible, God said, man, da, 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 da. no. It hasn't got any power. But if you meditate on it and it, gets a pa- it becomes a part of your spirit, that is when you can. That's when the, um, the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the rhema of God that is like that. Not the ordinary word of God. Hallelujah. And the Bible is an instruction manual to man. Let's take our gadgets, for example. When you buy your phone, most of the time we like to buy branded things. Samsung, iPhone, Sony Ericsson, um, gadgets that have names, you know, and they always have their names labeled on them. Why? Because the company is proud of the product they have. They know that the product they have is a reliable one. It will function well. So they are not afraid. I've seen products in China that didn't have any names. And when they got a problem, you couldn't work on them because no one knows which company it is. But if you get your iPhone, your Samsung, everybody knows what type of product it is. You buy it, you are confident. It's the same thing with God. And you always get a user manual which gives you the guidelines and the instructions as to how to operate it, how to fix it, how to where to press to receive a call, where to press to make a, type a message, send a message, receive a message. It's the same thing with God instruction manual to man. That is the Bible. Project 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. Can someone read for me? Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. All scripture is driven by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for p- reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, I want us to pay close attention to this part. For instruction in righteousness. Instruction here doesn't mean, hey, do this, do that, go here, do that, you know. Instruction here means it's a lecture, a teaching, a guideline. It is showing you what to do, what not to do, what to accept, what not to accept. It is showing you who you are and who you are not. The Bible tells you God wants you to prosper. Why would you argue with that? The Bible tells you you are righteous. Why would you argue with that? It tells us what God purposes for us, what God has made us to be. That is what instruction here is talking about. It's not a strong voice. It is a voice of teaching, showing us, guiding us as to what God wants us to be, what he doesn't want us to be, where he wants us to go and where not to go. And the Bible is divided into two, as we all know the New Testament, and the Old Testament. The Old Testament, simply put, is revealing to man 
the coming of the Messiah. Because when man fell, he had to put certain strategies into place, right? And aside writing the purpose for which he created man in the Bible, he had a special plan. That is to bring the Messiah. Because it, it, it was the Messiah who only could bridge that gap that was broken. And the, um, the Old Testament is only showing us how the Messiah came about. It, is, it paves way as to how the Messiah came about. And if you remember the story of Moses... When they were in the wilderness, Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness, you know the Israelites used to complain a lot. Everything they were complaining. And at some point, they complained so much that God became angry with them many times. And this particular time, he became so angry. So he, he sent some fiery serpents. That is in Numbers chapter... Numbers chapter 21, 4 to 9, to come and bite some of them. In fact, to bite them. And a whole lot of them died. So they went to Moses to plead with Moses, to intercede on their behalf. So Moses spoke to God. God being a merciful God, he asked Moses to make a bronze serpent and hang it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten and looked at it received life. The Bible tells us that this serpent demonstrates the Christ. It is a type of Christ. And if you remember where they, they were thirsty at some point, and Moses was supposed to speak to a rock. First, he was asked to strike a rock, which produced water. The second time, he was asked to just speak to the rock, but in anger. Because the people were always complaining. He struck it twice. Water came out anyway for them to drink. But the Bible tells us later again that that rock was a type of Christ. So the Old Testament was just revealing to us how the Messiah will come. And what will happen afterwards. Then when we take the New Testament. The New Testament... Is the, it's when the purpose of God for man was fulfilled. Why? Because the Messiah had now come. He came to, to, to fulfill the purpose for which he came. To die, to suffer on the cross for our sins. Isaiah and most of the prophets of old, they never saw the Christ. But they foresaw him in the spirit that he was coming. Prophet Isaiah is one of the prophets who spoke a lot about the coming of the Christ. He didn't live to see him come, but he foresaw it and foretold it. And so the Christ came and fulfilled the purpose for which he was supposed to come. When do you become a Christian? Or who is a Christian? You don't become a Christian because you were born in a Christian home. No. Or because you, you, you come from a country that is... Christian or a country that is mainly dominated by Christians. That doesn't make you a Christian. You don't become a Christian because you go to church every Sunday or because you have a Bible or you read your Bible. That doesn't make you a Christian. But you coming from a Christian home somehow led you to being a Christian, but it's not solid because there are people who came from Muslim homes and yet they became Christians. Nobody in their family was Christian, but they somehow became Christians. So you don't become a Christian just because your parents were Christians or because you were going to church. It is a very solid and firm decision that you take at some point in your life. You sit down and then you decide, I want the Lordship of Christ over my life. The Bible says that you don't just believe. You have to believe and you have to confess it. The Lordship of Jesus Christ over your life. Then the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. So Christianity is the God life in man. And God's life in man gives you 
the life that you live. And so we say Christianity is a life. God's life supersedes your life. It supplants your life. It takes charge of your life. That is Christianity. And for your information, the very first time you, you became born again or the very first time you accepted the Lordship of Jesus Christ into your life, when you confessed it and did what you had to do and they told you the Holy Spirit is now living in you, it was real. It happened. It is not an assumption. It is not a speculation. It happened. It is not that you just think, oh, I think he came inside of me. He lives inside of me. And you just think the greater one lives inside of me. And you are jumping. No. It really happened. It is a real life that happened. He lives inside of you. He takes his high seat in your life, the high place in your life. So then your life doesn't belong to you anymore once you accept him. You are no more yourself. Your everything belongs to him. And being a Christian is not just following Jesus Christ or reading your Bible here and there. No, that doesn't make you a Christian. Actually, Christian is not a word also that Jesus Christ gave to us. No. In the days of Bible, Bible days, in the New Testament, the followers of Jesus Christ went to preach or to teach in a city called Antioch. I don't know if you've come across it in the New Testament. The city of Antioch. And the unbelievers there, they observed that these people are always, they are followers of Jesus Christ. And they are always preaching Jesus Christ. So they started to call them Christians. And that's how come the word Christian stayed. And, and so it is not, it is, not uh, it is the unbelievers who gave the word Christianity, um, Christian, to Christians. Now, when we say Christian, how many of us know that Christianity is not a religion? Well, if you don't remember, I'm reminding you. That's why we are here. It's a revision class, like I told you earlier. Christianity is not a religion. What is a religion? It is a patterned way of doing things. Christianity is not a religion. We don't do things like that. Religion is a particular way of doing things. You have to do this at a particular time. You have to go here at a particular time. Let's take a our brothers in the Islamic community, for example. Islam is a religion. Why? Because they have ways of doing things, specific ways of doing things. In Islam, before you pray, you have to perform ablution. That is where you, you have to cleanse yourself. You wash your hands, you do some cleansing before you can pray. You have to pray specific prayers five times a day. Even before you touch the Quran, you have to perform ablution before you can touch the Quran. But it's not so in Christianity. Christianity is a real life. You live towards God, towards your fellow men, and then towards yourself and for yourself. Because when God comes inside of you, his presence gives you that life that you live. So you don't live your life anyhow. Somebody said that ever since he became a Christian, Christianity hasn't done anything for him. And the man of God said, Christianity will not do anything for you. You have to do something with your Christianity. Think about it. If it's true or false, it's true. You have to do something with your Christianity. The Bible tells you that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He can do all things inside of you. And he tells you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And so, if you've heard this and then you still have the mentality that you can't do anything for yourself. 
How is Christianity then going to do things for you? You have to do things with your Christianity. Know that the life of God is inside of you. So there is no way you can easily fall sick. That asthma you had, it has to disappear. Because it's in the wrong body. It's in the wrong body because the greater one is inside of you. You just don't sing it, no. That's the reason why we learned confessions some time back. To speak great things over your life. Speak great things into your future. Because we have the, we were, we were made to function and be in the image and the likeness of God. So if God commanded the, uh, this to happen, this to happen, he spoke things into being. Why can't you speak things into being? He gave you the power to speak. And so you can also speak all those things into being. Hallelujah. Since this is a year of the word of God, and we've been privileged to learn some Greek words. Today I also have two Greek words to share with you. The first one is suke. Yes, suke. I'm not so sure of the spelling because I checked two spellings and I got them. So I'm not really sure which is right, but you can write it down in U.S. S-U-K-E-Y, suke. That's the one I went for. But I'll research into it more and I'll let you know the right spelling, suke. Suke, S-U-K-E-Y, suke. And suke is the ordinary human life. Everybody who is born into this world has to care because it is a normal, ordinary human life. There is nothing special about that life. It is a life that everybody comes into the world with. But there is another life which is called Zoe. Z-O-E. Zoe. And this kind of life is the life that Jesus brought into the world. It is the Christ life Zoe project first John chapter 5 verse 11 to 12 first John chapter 5 11 to 12 First John chapter 5, 11 to 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. What did it say? No, 12. Go back to 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you don't have the Son of God, that means that you just have suke. You just have an ordinary life. A life with nothing special in it. But he who has the Son has life. And this is not just ordinary life it's talking about. It is talking about eternal life. And initially, I thought eternal life meant after you've gone to heaven, then you can have eternal life. No. You don't have eternal life after you go to heaven. What if you don't go to heaven? But even if you go to hell, it is eternal death. But eternal life begins here on earth. Once you accept the lordship of Jesus Christ over your life, you start enjoying eternal life. And this is the life that we call Zoe, the son of God over your life. The possession of Jesus Christ in your life is the kind of life that we call Zoe. It is not an ordinary life. It is a special kind of life, a supernatural kind of life, a divine kind of life. Because you having the son of God and having life, 
you are not an ordinary person. You are more than just who you think you are. There is more to your life than just what you know. You are a supernatural being. You can do anything. Jesus said that you can do more than he did. He healed the sick. He worked lots of miracles. And you can do same. Every time a man of God encourages us that sometimes you can just hit your leg against something in the room. And when you do it, don't say, out. As soon as you hit it, you say what? Be healed. Don't think about the pain. And if you don't practice it, Christianity is a life of faith. If you do not practice your faith, you will not be good at it. When things get tough and you start to come and hey, stomach, go. Pain, go, 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 go. The pain will still be there. And it will, you will be surprised it will increase. But the more you keep saying it, you keep practicing it, you'll be surprised the pain will even be afraid to come now. Because it knows that <laughs> as soon as it possesses this body, there is nothing that it can do to you. So having the life of Christ is what gives you eternal life. Now, Christianity is Christ's life in the human life. It is the manifestation of the righteousness of God in the human being. Christianity is the daily walk of divinity in humanity. That is God's daily walk in a man. That means that you live out the word of God. That is why there is the need to study and to have good knowledge on the word of God. Because if you don't have the knowledge of the word of God, you will know who you are in Christ, true or false. Those times if we fell sick, in fact, you will fall sick every time. And any time you fell sick, you didn't even know you weren't supposed to fall sick. But getting to know who you are in Christ, you know that you don't even have the right to fall sick. Yes, you don't even have the right to fall sick. Who wants to fall sick? No one wants to fall sick. And how did we get to know that? Through the word of God. Listening to the word of God. Studying his word. Understanding his word. So living out the word of God. And have you ever heard of someone saying, you may be the only Bible someone is reading? Who has heard of that statement before? Yes. This is what it's talking about. You may be the only Bible someone is reading. You say you're a Christian. So your life must manifest the word of God. Literally, we have to be able to read the life of God. Or the word of, we have to be able to read the word of God in your life. You live out the word of God in your life. That is who a true Christian is. Or a true believer is. One whom you can see the manifestation of the word of God in his life. If we can see the manifestation of the word of God in your life, does it make you a true Christian? But a true Christian, we have to be able to read the word of God in your life and see it manifesting. There are many times when we, we like to do other things. We are busy doing other things. Even some preachers, they are busily doing other things for good. I remember when Brother George came to share. He made mention of it, about us having an intimate relationship with God. And Sometimes you are busily doing other things, maybe winning souls for Christ or doing something for Christ, but you are neglecting your relationship with God. 
And one of the ways you can maintain that relationship with God is through your studying of the word of God. If you don't study the word of God, you cannot have an intimate relationship with him because you cannot function the way he wants you to function. You cannot. And we've learned previously that when you are sad, God is sad. He's a God of emotions. If you are happy, he's happy because the Bible says that God wills us to prosper and to live in good health. The plans he has for us are for prosperity. They are for good, not for evil or calamity. God doesn't wish it. Some people fall sick or bad things happen to them and they go like, well, if God wants me to be, like, be lame all my life, then so be it. No. God doesn't want you to be lame. God is a perfect God. He doesn't make, he's not an, a God who makes abnormalities. He doesn't do anything and leave it empty. He doesn't. Whatever he does, he does it well. He makes everything well. He doesn't do things halfway. He's not a God of anyhow. That's why if, if you say that, if you say you have God's life and you don't live well towards other people, you have an anyhow life. You don't respect your man of God. When he's in front of you talking, you're playing with your phone, chatting on WhatsApp, WeChat, doing your own things. And at the end of the day, you talk about how much you love God. The relationship you have with your man of God is the same relationship you have with God. If you treat that kind of life anyhow, you will have an anyhow life. And you having an anyhow life towards others, you end up having the same anyhow life for yourself. And when things are not working for you, you don't understand. It's because of the life that you are living. The life that you chose to live. God said he has given us, what? Life and death. It is up to you to make the right choice. And it's only through the word of God we can make the right choice. You cannot make the right choice if you don't know who God wants you to be or where he wants you to be at what time. That's why we need to study the word of God. And I'm very excited for this year because it's a year of the word of God. You read, you understand, and you know what God has for you. And every time a man of God encourages us to to listen, to try to listen to audio messages. Those of us who don't know how to listen to audio messages. And frankly, any time he said that, my mind was on video messages. And so one day it dawned on me that, oh, it's audio, not video. Because many people cannot listen to audio messages. They just want to see the man of God moving up and down, the people being shown on the screen, but we have to learn to listen to the audio messages. Do you know that there is, Christianity is not a religion, but there is a religion in Christianity. There is a religion in Christianity, but it is not a religion in itself. James chapter 1, verse 27 James 1:27 James chapter 1 verse 27 Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world What did he say pure and undefiled religion there is religion in Christianity, but Christianity is not a religion. That is what man of God mostly refers to as the cultures of Christianity. Because religion is a culture. But Christianity is not. So, it is our culture to visit the orphans, to help the needy. It is one of the things 
one of our cultures, but it is not what will save us. You visiting the orphans and the widows and helping people and doing that and that for people is not what is going to save you. We've learned time and time without number that you can live a life you think is perfect. But if you don't have the life of Christ in you, you are living an empty life. You can see someone very rich, he has everything. But if he's not born again or he hasn't got the life of Christ in him, he's living an empty life. The only time you can have eternal life is when you have the life of Christ in you. When you have Zoe. That is the only time. So, as part of our religion, as part of the religion in Christianity, we help the needy. We like to visit the orphans, the widows. When someone is sick in the hospital, everybody wants to go and visit the person. Check out how they are doing. It is a religion in Christianity. It's not that if you do not go to visit the person, it is so bad. No. Or you, you don't go because people are going, or hey, if I don't go, they say Jesus is a bad person. No. You don't go with that mentality. If you go with that mentality, you are acting pure religion. No. You go because of the love that we share. We have a life of love. That is a Christ love. The love between us is what makes us want to do things for each other. Those people who don't come to fellowship or are always in the hostel, how many of them have you thought of buying them anything? But you always want to do something for those people you fellowship well with. It's because of the love that we share that keeps us, that bond between us. That makes us do all these things. So there is a religion in Christianity. But Christianity is not a religion. And Christianity is the only... Well, the world doesn't know how to classify Christianity. Because the Bible says that there are mysteries to the world. They are mysteries to the world, but he has revealed things to us because we are his. But if you do not belong to him, you become blinded. You don't understand. When you ask how many religions we have, they will mention Christianity number one. Even in school, in primary school, they taught us we have three religions. Traditional religion, Christian religion, Islamic religion. And we were happy because we thought we knew. Because when you write exams and you answer it, you get all the marks. But now we know that it is not a religion. But just so you get your 100 marks, you have to include it. Even many times you filled forms, especially at home, where they will put somewhere, which religion are you? Or they will put religion and they will put Christianity. You have to take it. Sometimes you even have to write it yourself. At other times, you don't even know if you have to write Christianity or Christian. Some write Christianity, some write Christian. But it's not a religion. It's a life that God lives inside of man. And then he gives you, through the life that he lives inside of you, you are able to live towards him, towards your fellow men and then towards yourself, to have a good life. Sometimes we have to stand up for what we don't like. Something is disturbing you, just face it. That's why we need our rima. The Bible said, the light of God is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. When you walk in light, do you stumble? No. You walk freely because you can see everything. Everything is clear. Everything is magnified to you. But when you walk in darkness, you stumble. You don't even know where you are going. You have to be touching things, looking here and there. But in light, you feel free. That is what the the word of God is to us. It is a guide. It is a light. It is a light. That leads us to the right. Our Heavenly Father, we give you glory.
We thank you so much for the message you've brought to us today. We thank you for enlightening our spirits, for feeding our hearts, for feeding our spirits with your word. We know that we will never be the same. And we know that your word is the only thing that can change us and can guide us through our daily walk. Because we know that Christianity, pure Christianity, is you, your daily walk in our lives, giving us the strength to live the word that you have given us. We thank you and we give you glory and praise for all that you've done. Amen. <laughs>